Welcome to the today's CP program on Back to Basics on International Transaction, Understanding of Section 9. We heartily welcome today's speaker, C.A. Ravunala Parthasarthi, sir. We request, uh, please raise to the motor song. Section 9, uh, which is slightly different from the other sections, is 
most of the sections will talk about taxing or income that actually happens in India or on the activity that actually carries out in India. While section 9 goes slightly over what we call it as an extra territorial what we call. So that is why the section has uh, undergone so many changes over the years and it is learning for both the business and the income tax department in amending this section and it has been amended retrospectively since the introduction of the law so that was how this section got amended over the years so a few points about section 9 Indian income tax law recognizes residential based taxation for taxing the residents of India so if you are if you are resident in India then your global income gets taxed and because it is because of your residential status in India and the other concept is called source based taxation approach for non residents so source based is where the income is accruing or where the income actually comes out so for example where a company is located in the US or in Singapore where an Indian company makes a payment to that person then the source of payment is in India so the government tends to tax that income because the source is in India but the recipient is abroad so this is the difference between a residential based and source based source based taxation is a principle in tax where taxation of income is determined based on the location or source from which the income is derived location or the source so where the income is getting paid out from India where an individual, a firm or a company makes a payment from India to get a service from a person who is located outside of the country that is where this taxation kicks in though the person who is receiving the money may not have any presence in India may not do any business in India but still the source of income, the originator of income is in India that is ordinarily the country from where the income originates as the primary right to tax regardless of the tax based residency so whether the company is the recipient is an Indian entity or not an Indian or not still the Indian government gets the right to tax it this principle is relevant in the context of international taxation this is where international taxation comes where a person or two countries are involved a person or two persons who are, who are in different jurisdictions are involved that is where the international taxation is where individuals and businesses may have income from multiple countries. Source based taxation helps in preventing the double taxation and tax avoidance and ensures that income is taxed where it is generated. So, like, there are two concepts here one is double taxation, second is tax avoidance. Double taxation is like I pay from, let's say, the reverse scenario where you get an income from Singapore. Singapore, the person is going to pay you the income, deducts tax and gives you the money. So I get, I will 100 rupees, I get 90 rupees, 10 rupees in deducts tax. Now, I will have to pay tax in India on the entire 100 and not on the 90. So, I pay tax in India and I have to pay tax in Singapore. Now, this is double taxation. So now, I have to avoid this. So what I will do, since I have already paid 10 rupees tax in Singapore, I will claim credit of the 10 rupees tax when I am filing my India tax return. Now, there is a slight catch here. This 10 rupees tax payment in Singapore is not equivalent to or you cannot treat this in par with your TDS in India. So there is a slight catch. So 10, you cannot claim 10 here in India. There is a formula which is carved out in Income Tax Act. So uh, section 90 carves out a formula. At the same time, if we, if we go to the double taxation treaties also, there is a formula carved out. Because 10, you have paid to the government of Singapore. Now, when you make a loss in India, you can file a tax return and claim refund of the entire TDS, but not the foreign tax return. Because 10 rupee tax I paid in Singapore, I cannot file a return with the Indian government and claim that 10 rupees. So, this is slight difference. So, and double tax avoidances, you cannot say that the, since I am a resident in India, the income Singapore government cannot tax it. So, you can escape tax in Singapore. And then I will say, this money is earned from Singapore, I will not pay tax in India. So, double non-taxation is also not possible. So, both ways you cannot escape taxes. The source based approach of taxation is dealt in section 9. So, section 9 talks about the entire source based taxation. Few principles in section 9. One is it creates a fiction as to the place of approval. So, here 
the grower section is only to shift the place of approval based on various nexus. That is, nexus is various closeness to the Indian country. Now, here we are only creating a fiction that the income accrues in India, that is all. This does not create any deeming fiction, that is, it does not say that what is the income. It says this income is accruing in India. Now, how to compute this? Come, this comes under different uh, uh, scope of income like salary, PGDP, or capital gains, etc. etc. But this section says the receipt or the income is from India. Now, Indian government will have a tax. So, it creates a fiction that it is tax only. It cannot fasten accrual of income unlike provision of deemed receipts. Like here, there is no deeming fiction that the money that you receive is deemed to be received in India. No, it does not say that money is received in India. It creates the fiction this particular income has a source in India. It deems it. This is not applicable in case of income received or deemed to be received in India. So, moment receipt is not applicable. It only talks about approvals, no receipts. <coughs> If the income is already accrued by virtue of section 5, that is, we have a section 5, which says ABC, this accrues in India, accrues in India. So, if something is covered in accrual, the deeming fiction does not come into place. So, moment, the starting section, when you are determining and uh, taxability of a particular receipt, it goes with section 5. In section 5, if something is taxed, then we will not even come to section 9. So, first comes section 5. This particular section is relevant for non-residents and resident but not ordinary. <coughs> so, this is the key point. Because How many days? Uh, the, the, the number of days for resident but not ordinary is how many days? So, that, there are a lot of amendments have come for that. So, let's say 7 out of 9 years, 729 days, etc. So, I will tell you that separately in detail. Here, let us assume that the person is a resident but not ordinary resident. Because uh, as recent as last for one year's budget, they gave, there, there came an amendment which said that uh, which brought in two more classes for a resident but not ordinary resident. See, if your income in India other than the foreign receipts is more than 15 lakhs, you automatically become a resident. So the R and OR exception will not be provided. And then uh, there were a lot of problems. One year, how many days you have to stay in India? In one year, moment, see, your stay cannot exceed uh, 60 days. 60 days? Yeah, 60 See, there are two conditions. One, cumulatively over a period of 7 out of 9 years or last 4 years is one condition. And in one year, you cannot stay more than 60. There are two conditions to be satisfied. Continue. Two, yeah, two both conditions to be satisfied for a person to become resident but not ordinary resident. The reason is very simple. For these two people, that is non-resident and resident but not ordinary resident, incomes which are accruing outside of the country is not taxable in India. So, whatever you source in India is only taxed. Now, there are so many types of incomes probably we will see in the next slide that which are, which earlier, bar in nine, they were never considered to be taxed in India. So, for resident, for non-residents and the other category, they were not taxed in India. Then the government brought in ABCDE to say that though you are a non-resident, though you may say that this particular receipt is not generated in India, but we will create a deeming fiction to say this is taxed in India. Now, by once you start looking at it, then you can understand how each and every section got worded and what the government was trying to tax in India. So, if you look at it, this is the broad category of uh, sections which covers what is the incomes which are broadly taxed. So, uh, we will anyway share the presentation. In specific notes, you can take first category accruing or arising directly or indirectly through or from. So, there are multiple words they will use it accruing or arising directly or indirectly through or from. So, this will be like we will just add A, B, C, D, E to say, uh, try to say covering everything. So, uh, like, so they are using all these words to ensure that nothing gets escaped because it is an inclusive definition. That is all. We will try to cover. So, now, what is this covers four points one, two, three, four, which is one is business connection, 
two is property, three is asset or source of income, four is transfer of capital asset. So now broadly they are categorizing what they want to tax it under four categories. One, what we call it as a business connection. So by business connection, we will see in detail, but the term business connection is if my income is generated based on any activity in India. So, for example, I do a business in Singapore, I come down to India on a monthly basis, means it can be a person, it can be a company, company can send somebody to India on a monthly basis. They, they create or they set up stalls in India, they publicize the product, somebody comes and uh, somebody comes to them and then they enquires about the product and these people will go back to Singapore, they place an order via email and they sell the goods to India. Now technically what happens, though I do not sell the product in India, but I carry out so many activities in India, like I appoint, I may appoint one person as an advertiser in India who can advertise my product, I can appoint one person to go and meet each and every client and then say that this is my product, they can explain, show the product. And finally, when they want to buy it, I can ask them to send an order via email and I can sell the product. Now, what you ultimately do is the sale, which happens at the end. But there are so many activities carried out in India. Now, the foreign company can say, see, I have sold the product from Singapore. It is brought in India. It will not be taxed in India. Then the government said, no, you have a business connection in India. Because of this business connection only, this income has arisen. So, that particular income will be taxed. So we will see in detail that point. Next is some property in India. So if you have a property in India, then whether you are selling the property which is in India from Singapore to Malaysia, still the property is in India, you will have to pay tax on that. Here by the term property, it is an all inclusive definition. It can be a house, it can be a sort of an uh, a boat or it can be any a, anything which is movable or removable. everything is covered so long as the property is in India which is it has an excess in India whether you transfer from Singapore to Malaysia or from Malaysia to US to Indian government will have the right to tax. Third is asset or a source of income is in India which is related to the term property but we will see few aspects on that in the next slides. The fourth is a transfer of a capital asset. So, capital asset here, which brought in so many uh, controversies, is this particular point transfer of a capital asset, which was carved out to say a share of a company will be treated as a capital asset. So, you would have heard of the Vodafone case, which, which traveled up to Supreme Court. So, this was the, though the, the Vodafone case finally uh, the sort of the tax department lost and the government actually the, the assessing won the case they brought to the amendment. So I'll just quickly go to that case law so that you will have a fair understanding why the entire thing happened. So so that this will be very interesting to understand what was the section trying to achieve. You see here I'll just explain you then the so HTL, which is Hutchison Company, was in Hong Kong. They had one subsidiary which is in Cayman Islands. They had another subsidiary which is in Mauritius. Mauritius ultimately had Hutchison India, which was Vodafone. So if you see the parent, subsidiary one, subsidiary two, subsidiary three. Now what they did, Vodafone UK purchased CGP, this company, shares of this company from Hong Kong and this company was brought out of Netherlands. So the chart came down to be Vodafone UK, Vodafone Netherlands, KMA Islands, Mauritius, HSNS. So this was the transaction. Now they proceeded against, so the, the notice was given to Vodafone stating that since you brought, you bought the shares of KMI items for X number, 
and the shares of Cayman Island and Mauritius has nothing, but for the Indian company, the entire value of the Cayman Island shares was only driven by <coughs> value of Indian company. So they invested around, let's say, one million dollars, but they sold it for hundred million dollars. So I invested one million dollars, and I am making on hundred million dollars. So the Indian government said this differential between the initial investment and whatever money you have paid to this person becomes taxed in India because the value accretion happened only because purchase and SR operated in India, nothing else. So Indian government wanted the fair share of taxes of the gain which was made by HTL Hong Kong. Now they did not proceed against HTL in Hong Kong. The notice was not given to HTA in Hong Kong because they never had any pan in India. They never had any address in India. They proceeded against what of stating you are an assessee in default because you should have deducted tax when you have paid the money. Section 195. What is the connection between the HTRL and what of one? So what of one purchased well, HTIL was the seller. Okay. Is, it, is this the parent company? Yes, this is the ultimate parent company. HTIL was the ultimate parent yes, company. Vodafone is a subsidiary. Vodafone is a subsidiary. Vodafone UK and Vodafone Netherlands. Vodafone's UK subsidiary was Vodafone Netherlands. Okay. So they purchased from but HTIL. Vodafone never invested, never in, invested India. in India. Yeah. So they say the reason is this because, see, they sold the shares of KMA Islands. KMA Islands shares. Kima Island company was only a table company with the incorporation certificate. So their, their balance sheet was like this. Capital, $1 million. Investment in Mauritius company, $1 million. Okay. That's nothing. Mauritius company, capital, $1 million. Investment in HCL, $1 million. That's all. Now, where is the and HCL? Is the Indian company, the big balance sheet. Now, when they purchased, why should I pay $100 million? Because I valued this company for 100 million dollars. Now, assume you take out this subsidiary, whether anybody will buy the shares of CGP for 100 million, the answer is no. So the government, Indian government said, because this company's value is only giving 100 million dollars for this entity, you are supposed to pay tax in India. So this is their consideration. Though at that point in time, there was no specific provision in income tax law. That is the point. So at that time, there was no specific provision in the income tax law, which we called as an explanation file. Explanation file, which they inserted to tax this. Explanation file to section 91 was inserted. It was an occasion where the waterfall was supposed to be dissolved. Because Subsequent, so the resolution happens. The, dis the dissolution happened subsequently. So this was prior to that. This was prior to 2012. So this happened in the year 2010. And the issue started happening in the year 2011. And then it slowly went down. So I ultimately they said. So they say the value was from India. But at that point in time, there was no provision in the law to, to there was no deeming provision in the law to say that if the value of shares of any company which is outside of the country, like CGP or Mauritius, if the value of the company is predominantly derived by the value of assets in India, <coughs> Indian government will have the right to tax, that is, income will be deemed to accrue or arise in India because of a property situated in India. That is the definition. There was no transfer of funds, you know. There was no transfer of funds. Then no, how come? Because they say the value, the underlying value. So that was the deeming fixed. See now, this is the point. See, nothing technically happened in India. Everything happened outside India. But there is a deeming fiction to say because this shares were valued by valued because of Indian company, this has to be taxed in India. So this is the fiction they brought in. Vodafone finally succeeded with the Supreme Court to say. The Supreme Court said, see, because there is no provision in the law right now, this is not taxable. 
That's all. It went up to Supreme Court. It was a very landmark decision. I have two doubts. Yes, sir. The one is the federal income in which it is income will be charged. Capital gains. Suppose it is a capital gains, one million dollars. If they are purchasing a half a million dollars, say less than that, the capital loss will be allowed to be carried forward. See, that is that's the point. Whether capital loss will be allowed to be carried forward. At that point in time, these were all the questions they asked. See, this was another question. See, first of all, this guy said, I purchased this for exact question, I purchased this from this person, but I don't know what was this investment cost. You cannot come and ask me, I am withholding, I don't know what is this investment cost, I don't know whether it was invested, I don't know whether it was invested through money share. So they say there was nothing. And the same question arose, like whether okay, if at all I had made a loss. And then the last would have been yes. because, the, because there was no return, no bank for the foreign company. Okay, but now, if you ask in today's scenario, yes, the last will be allowed. In today's scenario, the last will be allowed. But now, a person can always question how you can make a loss. They will get question. In fact, there is a far the rule which says fair market value. That's the one. That point in time, there was no provision for allowing a loss. You cannot try. Even now, if you see the latest, uh, one more very sort of an, uh, this budget, ancient budget, they brought in a very uh, bad or a very, uh, I don't know what term they used, but one amendment which came for share buyback by the companies. So, what they said earlier, there was a specific provision in the law to say how buyback tax will be calculated. Now, if a company does a share buyback, they say the entire money which is paid to the shareholder is dividend. So what will happen for your investment cost? The entire cost is a loss. This is the amendment. Now, whether somebody, whether somebody will be, let's say, in, in, in the scenario of let's say a resident taxpayer, it's very easy, okay, I get dividend. My entire investment is a loss. I may invest somebody as something else and then I can offset a loss. But imagine for a foreign company, which is a subsidiary in India, they do a share buyback. <coughs> the entire money is paid as, will be taxed as dividend. Your entire money of capitalism will be a loss. Now, whether they, they can invest in another company, grow another company, grow the company, sell, and when they will be able to adjust. But so, my understanding is this loss can be carried forward. Can be carried forward, but imagine, let's say, a company which has invested 10 million dollars and there's a buyback for 20, 10 million dollars is an investment, I'm making a loss. Now, is there a reasonable certainty by when I will make a 10 million gain and offset? So, that's the issue. So, this is the point. Supposing the Mauritius company got merged with the game and would it be considered as a transfer? Mauritius merging with the in today's scenario, yes, the answer is yes. How is it? Which, uh, because they say Mauritius, again, the, what is the value, well, what is the angling asset? Yeah. Same thing, the logic say, yeah. if Mauritius gets merged with Cayman Islands, still, would it be treated as a transfer? It is a transfer. And it's a transfer. And then it's a transfer. It is a transfer. See, again, you have a, you have a specific yeah. provision in the law, 47.4. 47 says this is a transfer, but they give an exemption. Same like India, yeah. there is a merger. Indian company, ultimate company. Ultimate company is Indian company. But still, there is also a provision which they have also added saying if there is a merger cross border, it is outside of the country. And if the transaction is considered to be tax exempt in that jurisdiction, India will also say it's tax neutral. So, another scenario. Same thing. If let's say Mauritius company gets liquidated, what will happen? The shares of the Indian company will ultimately sit in KMA Islands. So KMA Islands again has to file a return in India. As a assessee who is actually surviving post Mauritius, as a representative assessee, stating that I have received this shares of this company as a representative of Mauritius company, I have to file the tax return. And how capital gains will be computed is this company, 
cost of investment minus what was my uh, fair market value of the shares at the time of moving it back will be what section? 40, it's all 47. Share, uh, that is transferred or liquid, uh, that is extinguishment of right in the share of the company. That's all. It is a deal to transfer. It's a deal to transfer. So, like, see, you are what you are ultimately doing is you are transferring the shares from Mauritius. Indian company shares from Mauritius to KMA units. The income tax law has a specific provision for liquidation. Upon liquidation, when you transfer the assets, there is a specific provision to say if you are paying over and above the brought forward reserves, whatever is distributed beyond the reserves, it is capital gains. Up to reserves is dividend income. But that doesn't say anything. Mauritius holding so now this question was specifically addressed. They came up with a circular. So uh, yeah. separate circular. Separate circular. This is the dividends. So, overseas dividend paid by a foreign company deriving substantial value from India. Circular 4 of 2015. So, I'll just explain you with the same diagram. So, let's say Mauritius company declares dividend, be it cash or be it in the form of shares of the Indian company. Shares technically give it a dividend but given in the form of shares. That they say HCL, though HCL gives dividends to Mauritius, still, if Mauritius declares dividend, this company's dividend will not be treated as substantial value derived from India. So, there is specific exemption uh, circular given only to carve out dividend by the parent of an Indian company, which has again derived substantial value, to say that if CGP receives dividend from Mauritius, it is not actually in India. For that, there was specific card. Okay, then if CGP gives it to HCL. No problem. So, only taxes, HCL giving dividend to Mauritius is taxed in India. Any upstreaming from there on, no problem. No, I, I don't even want to HCL when India company to get foreign company. I only say, yes, for you are just being uh, like. No problem. No issues. No issues. So, is that circular is uh, addressing the issue? Yes, circular specifically on this issue. The dividends which is given, given by a foreign company, though the value was substantially derived from the Indian company, it is not taxed in India. So that is so, so, so you have a rule for you to avoid a tax by... The not problem is here, if you declare, see, the value doesn't go out anywhere, you see, it is only within the order. And anyway, the money is going to... See, but you know, when you say the exploitation and merger, you know, it is taxable. Correct. When you pay as a dividend, it is not taxable. Tax, yeah. so, see, the, the, the rationale is very simple. Though you declare as dividend, ultimately this company is still holding the shares of this company. You have a rule to protect how you cannot declare entire money as dividend unless you make profit. Yes, transfer, you said that ultimate company should have been an Indian company. Correct. Here, transfer is going to be a foreign company. Yeah, see, though you declare dividend, see, unless there is profits, you cannot declare dividends. Only when you have profits, you can declare dividends. So, still you will be protected. But if you are doing a capital reduction, let's say you give a capital reduction, by a capital reduction, we give the shares of this company, then that is tax in India. So we had a live uh, case. So you would have heard of this company called um, Groffers. There was a company called Groffers earlier. So the Groffers, they ultimately folded into Swiggy. Ultimately folded into Swiggy. So uh, this was probably, we didn't have the live here, but we actually same day we had this case. So Groffers Singapore, well, Singapore was the holding company for Groffers. They had an investment from, uh, I can draw properly on this. So, there was a company in UAE <coughs> which invested in Groffers Singapore. And Groffers Singapore had investment in Groffers India. So, 
they are invested in the form of preference shares. What Grafer Singapore did, they did a capital reduction of preference shares. So this preference shares got cancelled and what they did, they gave the shares of the Indian company as a venture. This was the data and this was done with a precondition that graphers will merge into Swiggy and this will ultimately get listed. So, this capital reduction was done with the precondition that I will reduce capital, give shares of Graphers India to you via Singapore and the Graphers India will ultimately merge with Swiggy which you should agree and Swiggy will in turn get listed. Now the problem was this, now whether the capital reduction which is done in Singapore and you are getting the shares. So let's assume UAE company has invested rupees 1000. They have given the shares of Graffers as consideration. Now assume rupees 500 is the consideration. Now the question is whether UAE is taxable in India. So I have not done any time. UAE has done nothing in India. I have invested in Singapore. But because I have received any shares of the Indian company, so shares of the Indian company means they say it is a resident in India, income accrues in India. So you have to be taxable. Now this complex transaction, you have to file a return in India and say that 1500, I made a loss of 500. Now to prove this, you should have the balance sheet of Singapore to say that this money of 1000 was only used for Grafer City. Now let's say Singapore has one more subsidiary in, in Australia and one more in Africa, then you cannot say that the value of this entire thousand was Indian. I should have split it into three countries. So there was first the confusion that whether this thousand was entirely invested in India and this you made a loss in India for five hundred. Then they have to sell the shares uh, rather much and then sell it ultimately. When they sold it, they made gains. Now whether this loss this will be adjusted, the return is filed with claiming the loss. So the, what, what the companies are in India, no? one is their loss making, one is profit making. And this, it, this is the only company in India. So Grafus was the only company. So Grafus, the capital loss was filed and was filed. Now it is actively taken for assessment because somebody has to explain the entire transaction and to understand and it is again a sort of a complex working sum. I have to prove the entire thousand was invested in India, that's the first part. Then they should allow me a loss under the capital gains mechanism. Third, finally when this company shares are sold, when you sold to this company shares, they will make a gain in India. That gain will get adjusted against this one. Why, why there are so many complications in the art? Whereas people are asking for foreign direct investment, Minister is going to America, President is going to America, Prime Minister is going to America, okay. everybody is going to America to get money. But all this law, this, this provision, if you tell the, the guy in America, he will say thank you very much for your coming and I will not do anything. See, uh, because I am, I am living in Seychelles. We are requesting for foreign exchange, uh, foreign direct investment. When these people come there, they, they, they welcome them, the act is so simple. Here, for for example, this I remember this uh, the, the paper, the Vodafone was crying, and they were just going to close the business. Uh, sorry, he knows that. Now he is saying that Supreme Court saved them, but still the income tax is not happy about it. See, uh, that's what they will change the act. 
just, just do a regulation and then say you have to pay this 25 million dollars or 25 million dollars just like that. But it was not creating a, a, a chaotic situation for foreign direct investors. I'm telling you honestly, this is why I came to it. Because in, the Indian taxation is so complicated, but people are afraid to come and do business. Unless you have a very high paying charter accountant with you, you will end up in trouble. I'm telling you. Yeah. Am I right? Two people. One is a lawyer, one is a child reporter. Highly paid child reporter, highly paid lawyer. And I think the demand for the uh, Vodafone India was quite, you know, sorry, the UK was quite huge. I think it's about, uh, I don't know. Thousands of crores. No, no, it's hard I think Raghavan knows. Raghavan was not happened the same year. I remember after three or four years later, they just, what we jumped out with the offering guys like that, and that say, ah, oh, I don't pay 25 million dollars. See, this, so again, so we made an amendment also. So it, it came, it was like, there was an amendment came. So, though the Supreme Court gave relief by our judgment, immediately the next budget they made a retrospective amendment. So, in statement, this is included and this is effective 1962. And then there was again a lot of human crime. And then, see, you see, because there is, there is something called uh, this was the term they used. This is called a doctrine of promissory estoppel. So this was the doc doctrine of promissory estoppel. They say, see, which means that the promissory, promissory estoppel. So it's a term. They say, once a government gives a promise, it back. cannot take back. So that's how it is. And unfortunately, government, what you are talking about, government means the president of India or prime minister of India or the income tax. So, government means it's always president. Unfortunately, what, government, government. you tell me honestly, four of them president, prime minister, government of India, official uh, income tax, or Indian government, Tamil Nadu government. Who is, the, who is the government here? Here, we say government is only central. So, we will only really talk about federal and not state. So it's central and then so under the government, so whatever taxes, you, you say it is income tax, it is excise or it is customs or even any department under the government. They say the moment you make a promise and then you have attracted investment based on a promise, you cannot go back on the promise. There is no, there is automatically no yeah. Income tax is automatically go back on the promise. Ultimately, it is holding back to the government. So it's like so. What happened is they say this is so. Vodafone immediately invoked the arbitration under the investment. So there is a bilateral investment agreement between India and Netherlands. So they invoked the arbitration. The case went to arbitration. Then only they finally they came back and said they they brought in two more explanations in this section. They said explanation uh, explanation. Finally, in the explanation, they brought two provisos to say that this amendment will only be prospective, which means that any investment or any notices given, though the amendment is retrospective, they brought in two, two provisos saying any assessment initiated after the date is 28th May 2012, any amendment made after any assessment made after that or any notices made after that only will be covered. Whatever is done prior to that, any assessment will be dropped, any taxes paid will be refunded and they gave some conditions that you should withdraw any appeals file, if you have removed any arbitration, drop off everything. The consequential tax, whatever it is, which was raised because of this particular point will be paid back. And this came after a lot of fight. So the only persons who made money, as you rightly said, were the whatever advisors. Like um, whatever advice, whoever advised either in India or the foreign country, those advisors or the lawyers made money. So barring to the end of the day, Vodafone came back to point zero, the <coughs> government also came back to point zero. The entire people who were with this made money. Like see. So that's how it works. So probably uh, later on they understood. See, what 
Again, the government understood. If you look at it, when you say India is growing, India is the investment jurisdiction, why people come out India is because India is the place where everyone can make money right now. So the government said, no, we need fair share of taxes. If you recently see equalization levy, there was one term you would have seen everybody, equalization levy, where you, if any foreign company sells data, sells games, etc., you pay from here, they should collect 2% and levy and pay money. So this, they call this a digital tax, digital taxation. So I will use this, so probably you can come back to this particular term. This is the term, significant economic presence. So this is a very good term. So if you see here, a foreign company, let's say the company in Singapore sends products to India, just selling products. Transaction in respect of any goods, services or property carried out by a non-resident in India, including the provision of download of data or software in India, subject to a payment threshold exceeding 2 crore rupees. So, if you are total sales by a foreign company to any person in India, if your total sales exceeds 2 crores in the financial year, then you create something called a significant economic presence, which is a business connection that is taxable. So, if you see, when you are importing a machinery from China for a value of more than 2 crores, then under section 911 it becomes taxable. It becomes taxable. But if it is for two different persons? See, if okay. it is only, you are only a look at from the Chinese company perspective. Okay. Aggregate, two crores, it becomes taxable. The company has to pay tax in India. But how they come out is because that's a double taxation in India. So you are significant economic presence, you become taxable in India. But I invoke the treaty provisions and then I escape that. Like because under the double taxation treaty, uh, selling a product in India, only when you have physical presence in India, it gets taxed. So otherwise it is not getting taxed. So again, they brought in one more issue, probably like where in international taxation there was a bigger problem. Everyone created an issue. They say that if you have to avail a treaty benefit, which is you have to take a treaty benefit, you should give a TRC, tax residency certificate, from the foreign person. And the foreign country's tax TRC should have a ABCD, there will be a lot of points. If that doesn't come, then Indian government says you should give a declaration in form 10F. So earlier it was a hard copy form, everyone were given hard copy form. Then they brought in a form which has to be electronically filed. Unfortunately, initial electronic filing mandated a PAN. Now without a PAN, you cannot create a login ID password and file and give that one. So there was a huge problem across everywhere because the moment you don't give a TNF, you cannot apply treaty. If you cannot apply treaty, Every sale to India becomes taxed in India. So there were a lot of huge hue and cry. And finally they said, okay, we will create a provision where you can do a TNF without a PAN. TNF without a PAN, but still if somebody has to sign it, you still need a DAC. So and anyway, so they are using Indian representatives to give a DAC. So if you see this, this is again a significant amendment. Now the problem is if a if a person is situated in a non-treaty jurisdiction, a treaty country where India does, it, or does not have a tax treaty, or there was a provision said, if the other treaty does not give us information as we ask, then I will notify that treaty, country as a non-cooperating country, so treaty benefits will not apply. So, this happened in the case of uh, Luxem, uh, one, one country was notified, because Luxembourg or one more, sometimes back they notify you one country. Cyprus. It was Cyprus or someone, something, Cyprus or Luxembourg, they notified. So I remember the moment it got notified. Uh, so in my earlier organization, the country's senior tax partners came on a call and there was a big discussion on how to tackle it. Because the moment you, the treaty, that, that country becomes notified, you cannot take treaty benefits. So once you cannot take treaty benefits, because of this law, whatever I import from that country becomes taxed. Now I will not, I will not be able to pay money without deducting tax in India. 
So this was the problem. Second, one more, like even if you systematically and continuously solicit business in India or engage in interaction with such number of number of three lakhs or more people in India through digital means. So, so we need not be too gross. Even if you say like I am going to collect 10 rupees per person for an online games or something, still if your total subscriber base in India is more than 3 lakhs, you still create significant economic presence and then your income gets taxed in India. So this was the amendment which was the latest into the Indian income tax law was in the section of significant economic presence. Now why they wanted to do this is slowly they started to understand like the big imports or the big sort of uh, transactions were not hitting them significantly. It was only the smaller transactions that was hitting them significantly. Take an example of a PUBG game or an uh, app which was the Chinese app. So these two are hurting them more than the big investments. Right? You can imagine the money that could have been taken out by these two gaming companies wherein they were they went on to a greater extent where the US government said you either transfer the ownership of these companies to something apart from China or else I will not allow you to operate in this country. See that was some place of the small monies slowly trickling out of the country was becoming so huge that I want to drag these people and tax them. So that's the point. So they brought in this amendment to say even a small payments of more than 3 lakhs, 10 rupees, etc. You have to pay tax in India. So this was the term. How a person paying to them would know that you know either that borrow is across the duty limit or the uh, number, number. So <coughs> see that is where. Uh, so let's assume there is you no know, genuine fellow from whom we are downloading a software to do something. Yeah, how do they know whether to pay or not to pay or something? Correct. So here there are two aspects. One, uh, when you are making any payment in non you are supposed to pay those declarations. And you do not. So you can only make it sufficient. As you no, that is sufficient. A fair service. Because as you, as you the you know, beginning of the year, I do January or June, July, whatever it is. It may not, it may not, it may not, it may So we take the same, same thing like when, when I came here to make the seminar. I say I am not contesting or I have no intention to contest in uh, this upcoming uh, election. Same way what? We, we, that is what you do in the institute. Income tax. Yeah. See, they say you have to take a declaration to say that you do, you do not have a PE as of now covering ACP or all sections or you don't intend to create a PE. So that is how you take a declaration and protect yourselves. That's all. Because moment you, you have taken the due diligence, then you don't become an SSE in default. Now the tax department can go against these people, but it cannot question the SSE who you have made the payment. So same thing happens, let's say for example in case of a salary okay, okay. even then then that fellow should have done you know the F of ten F and then then in the government can go and catch them. See that is why they want to then ten F. Okay then I can do it. Exactly. Ten F is a must. Otherwise you will be proceeded against. You should take a no P declaration and a TRC plus TNF moment you make the remittance. These are yes. When you say SCP, hmm. it doesn't need to be a company. Nothing, this is the point. Well, SCP, exactly. Exactly. See, SCP can exist regardless of where the agreement is in or whether where the non resident has a physical presence in India. Nothing is so there is no need for a company to be registered or anything. Nothing. Uh, though you are sitting in the US, you still can create SCP in India and Indian government can still tax them. There is a fiction you create. This income is. Who would tell income tax that this is happening? Sir, now see the information exchange is happening. See, like the moment you create, see, I'll just tell you the, the equalization levy or in, in GST, there is something called OED, online database access, etc. Now, how they identify it? You have an app, app store, so they were tracking the app store and which companies were registered in the app store, there was a new notice. They were tracking even your app store. So you can see uh, Google app store, you can see that okay, this is the app which is owned by X company. You can see the number of subscribers there. So they will see you are selling in India, so no pay tax. Notice is where sent. So it is being tracked as.
So whether you have a residency in India, so both GST and income tax can come and needs to. Probably now, how we are going to recover is a different story. See now, how you want to recover, it's a completely different story. But you can be questioned. Now whether you choose to respond or not, who said that notice to America? Any, we, they can even send it to Joe Biden or uh, Barack Obama. See, they, see, you can send income tax department as free will to send it to anyone. But how they are going to respond? Whether you want to respond, whether you have any intent to respond, if you do not respond, what is the risk that you face is the problem. The so moment, technically, yes. they will send, they will catch on to the fellow who send money in terms of and say that, no, you are sent without any Correct. Okay. So that is the thing. Yeah, that, that's the, if you have any subsidies, so they can try. So, this is the one point, significant economic presence. Before they need revenue, you have to that. See, you have to see, even before you make the payment, apart from your agreement and the invoice that you have, you need to have one, a no PE declaration from uh, the person, like stating you do not have a physical presence in India, you do not have a PE as per Article 5 of the treaty, you have to have that declaration one. Second, NF, which is the form which they are filing with the Indian uh, Income Tax Department and giving you the form. And then if a DRC is also required. A tax resident certificate issued by the local tax department stating they are Sir, these three is in addition to Form 15 C and C. See, Form 15 C and C is what we as an Indian uh, tax resident and Indian CA generator. To give the Form 15 C and C, we need these three declarations. Now, both the chartered accountant who signs the form and the company can be considered against. Even, see, unfortunately, even inspectors will call the CA and say, how can you give this seven minutes? It's too late, it's happening. For giving a 2,500 rupees form of the CV, you will be asked to come to the in your office and say, where is the OB, where is the CV? See, a company can ask you to sign 15 forms and give you 15, 15 CVs in a month and I'm going to pay you 30,000 rupees or 40,000 rupees. But the risk you are undertaking is slightly higher. So you say it's only for software numbers or for all payments? Any payment, any non-resident payments. It's not only software. Whatever non-resident payments the company is making, these three forms are managed. Right, especially when you want to pay the sir, TDS. So even with TDS, see for example, even with TDS, for example, let's say you are making a payment of royalty. Okay, you are making a royalty payment. Royalty payment, you say, that tax at 10%. Now, you don't know whether the company has a Office yeah, in India. Yeah, yeah. Moment B in India, it becomes 40%. Or now 35%. So, whether you deduct tax or not, all these three documents are mandated. This now, of the See, you cannot apply. DTA is not if you need that. Uh, DTA is Exactly. See, DTA rate. See, now earlier income tax rate was 10%. Now income tax rate has become 20% or 20%. So, earlier rate was less reduced. From 25, they brought it to 10. So that they want to bring in money, they want to have a fine. 20. Now they have increased it to 20%. Which is an FTS under law, income tax law, 115 BA or AB. So that is the problem. So all these things are mandated. So in this case, the human assets are subject to this specification. So when the financing company, say for example, they import, say, iPhone, Apple company. For us, major purchases from foreign but, because correct. most assets are available. Correct. 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 So, some of the purchases are coming from abroad. So, we cannot go within each and every importers to give this uh, declaration. So far, currently, we are doing only for service mm -hmm. to so You have to see this at least going for it. Make sure that every purchase you make, you get these declarations. But technically, this is already subject to a bill of entry and all assessments you have done. But it is getting covered in the 37 BB is not required to give in a form 15 C. Sir, form 15 C is not required. That CA certificate is not required. Yeah, right. right. That is fine. But now, let's say, how do you conclude it is not taxable? See, this provision clearly says if you import a product, now, moment you import a product, let's say from a vendor, you, if you are a crossing, who goes? Even if you, see, even, you don't know whether he is uh, Overall, it's Indian customer base. So, if you are crossing two groups, then now you have to conclude it is not taxable. Now, under the 195 says any payment to a non resident 
If it is subject to tax, you are supposed to have tax. Or you should conclude it is not subject to tax. It is not IIT. It is not free for technical service. But it is an income which is deemed to approve in India because you are buying a property or you are buying goods, which is because of a business connection. The first word in the section, which will say that any income accruing that through or from any business connection, that's the word they use. Now, in business connection, they say if the value of the property in India is more than two crores, you create a significant economic presence, which is which is considered as a business connection. So it becomes taxed. Now, how to come out of this taxation? You will have to go to double taxation treaty with the wherever the buyer the seller is there to say the seller selling goods in India, which is his business income, it is not IIT, it is not FTS, it is a business income. Because he does not have a permanent establishment in India, it is not taxable in India but in the other country. So to take this position, you need to get a no PE declaration. So only when he gives a no PE declaration and he has to prove that he is a tax resident of the other country. So to prove his tax residence, he should give you the DRC and the farm tenants. Only when you have these three documents, you are your position gets backed up by this, uh, backed up by these evidences, and say you can make the payment without taxes. Otherwise, see now they are not coming behind you, but two years down the line they come because every remittance is tracked. You get a notice. Ah, oh, these give me files. Yes, yes, yes. From a banker, I think they are filing in their foreign uh, specific Exactly. Yeah. So through the 15 CC, they drag this, they came to us. They, so they need to always just give me the agreement, invoice copy, 15 CC, please. So if you don't see the problems again, it is over and above your cost. You have to pay with any tax. And they ask you to get 10% of the <coughs> gross number. It's just like, it will be huge. Because it is on your expense 10%, not on your profits. Export, exports are exempted, no? Exports, if it does, we are only income taxes anyway, we pay tax on exports, no problem. It is the, the money is only coming into India, so no issues. The transaction is respect of any business. Somebody is ordering a good for $250,000 equal to two crores. Correct. These are business transactions. From India, selling it. I mean, these are export business. Exports, so no problem. This is not exempt. No, yeah, no problem. Since it is a form, then that is annually you have to find out. Only one single. Once a year, once in a year you have to get it. Every year you have to get TRC, every year you have to get OPE. Because TRC will expire, no? See, if you go to income tax department to take a TRC for us, they will give you for this assessment year, you are resident in So next year you have to take the same concept. Same across the same issue. Same way. The problems in India for giving a TRC is to settle all the money. And seriously, they are asking you settle all the tax demands. If you have a demand here, no, I will not give you TRC. Yes. Even if it is subject to appeal. See, if it is 20%, okay, but if there is, if you have some 143 one demand. Oh, they say, no, I will give you next week, I will give you 15 days later. This is a very dangerous provision. Very dangerous provision. Because it looks as if the all, all we can, we can just start telling what is this. Yes. So it looks as if any activity people are doing from overseas. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good source. Yes, they are seeking to be a good See, so far credit card payments, so there are two angles to it. One is if you are a GST angle, income tax angle, the third is a FEMA angle too. So FEMA angle is still liberalized remittance scheme, where credit card payments still does, if you are traveling abroad, you are making those payments, still you just will call and other things. For company, if you are making credit card payment when you are going abroad, still it is outside of the money. And the government, and again, from India, I am making the credit card payments. I don't make the payment to a foreign bank. I only make the payment to Indian bank. Still, you will be out of 15 CA in some ways. That's what I do. Correct. Still, so employee pays through corporate credit card, still, it is outside this campaign. Now, see, now, the problem will arise when you are doing an assessment. 
So for example, one of transaction here is fine. Now you are trying to circumvent to say, let's say I am going to buy a software worth, let's say 10 lakhs. You are asking your employee to unlimited card for credit card. So it's making a payment via credit card. And then you are paying setting the credit card in India. Then you will be lost. Because see, somebody will question the intention. They can go underneath the transaction and say, this is only to avoid the tax you have done. So probably a small payment is fine. So as long as he does it, it doesn't become a small, smaller payment when he's traveling or some online database you want to download an annual report. 5,000 rupees would be good, it's fine. But an annual subscription for a software which is worth 5 lakhs, you can't pay by it. So, and then if you see the accumulation also, so it, it purely goes by the material and the risk that you want to take. So, this is one part. Significant economic presence will create a business connection. The other one is this agency. Agency. So, one way I have a business connection because of significant economic presence or by doing some activity in India. Now, I don't want to do the activity directly. I appoint an agent. Now, what to So, business activity is carried out through a person acting on behalf of a non resident. So, I sit in US, I have an agent in India. The agent will go to the customer, he will negotiate everything, he will, he will identify a person, he will get contracts. And I will just sign the contract in the US and sell the goods to India. So, they say, if you have an agent who has an average excellence in India, an authority to conclude contracts on behalf of a non resident here is an authority, so he doesn't actually conclude, it is only an authority. Second condition, habitually concludes contracts. So he concludes contracts on your behalf or habitually plays the principal role leading to conclusion of contracts. So whatever he does, see he can either conclude contracts or he, he will take it to an extent where he will bind you, but he just you sign it from abroad or he has the role in bringing it together. And in the name of a non-resident or for transfer of ownership of or granting of the rights to use any property owned by the non-resident. So, you may have an IP there, you may have a software there, you are giving a right to the software to the person in India or the non-resident use or for the provision of services by the non-resident. You want to avail some services in the form of any professional services, designing or engineering you need to do. So, a non-resident, though he doesn't have any physical presence in India, but still, if the conclusion of the contract is done through an agent, then this agent creates you a business connection. So you are acting through this agent. So because you are acting through this agent who is working in India, that income becomes taxed in India. There is one exception to it if you say the agent independently does not, sorry, the agent acting independently does not establish a business connection. So, if the agent acts for 100 type, 100 similar to you, there is 100 people or 10 people in as, as a business, then there is no problem. The reason why it is no problem is because he will anyway charge you for the activities that you are doing in India. So, Indian government gets the money for the activities carried out in India. So, no problem. See, if you see, there is one uh, important point in this. Uh, In the business connection, uh, there are multiple reasons how business connection comes. But in this business connection, there is only one, one very important point is not the entire income will be taxed in India. They will, there is an attribution principle. So to the extent of activities carried out in India, it will get taxed. So let's say I sell a product from the US. Though I manufacture it, I do marketing in India, I do sales in India, and then I do after sales service in India, they say. To the extent of activity that you do it in India only, I will tax you, not the entire value chain. So, in the agency also, it is simple that because the person is acting on your behalf, then I am going to tax you. If he is acting for multiple people, he is doing it in an independent capacity, then you will not be taxed. One more point, having no such authority, which is the signing authority, habitually maintains a stock of goods 
and regularly delivers them on behalf of the Nanak state. So, you are having an agent in India and you have already shipped that the goods to them. He is just having a storehouse here and every time you get an order, he is going and delivering the order. So, then you create a business connection. <coughs> because what you are doing, here what are you doing? Though you have the stock in the US, though you want to get the market. So, I am just saying, okay, let me send 100 quintals of goods to India and we store in India. Every day or last, I am delivering it. So, now what you have done, you are doing an activity of putting the goods in India and delivering it on time. So, they say, this is a business connection. You pay, you pay tax to the extent of activity they put in India. Now, what is the proportion of this activity? It will be decided based on the total value chain that you are having in India. So, this is one. Third, habitually secures orders in India mainly or only for the non resident You secure orders. So, here you conclude contracts. You have no conclusion but just delivery of the goods. Here, you just get orders for the customer. Doing a simple marketing work in India. So, so what is the difference if it is a specific agent is appointed or the agent is you not know, acting on behalf of multiple people? If you see in the second part, you know, the other fellow will get money from the uh, non resident, therefore, you know, India is uh, getting you know, the tax share of the tax. Same so thing can happen even if it is a you know, specific uh, uh, agent. But then, how does so anybody, how does anybody know that this agency agreement, you know, either in, uh, you know, a sole agent or in, uh, you know, a general agent? So, now I first answer why independent agent is not covered. Right. See, the same like, like as a chartered accountant, if I have 100 audit clients and I get fees from 100 audit clients, I will be independent. If one client says, you have to sign like this, I say, no, I won't. But he is your only client. Then what happens? He will be able to, he will be able to arm his team. Same thing here, if you see, he is your only agent, means what? I will decide what is the price I should pay. So let's say I am going to pay only ten dollars. Whereas he, the effective work he would have done is for hundred dollars. So the pro the amount of profit which is attributable to India, if he is an independent agent, he will anyway collect it from me. But if he is not independent, that amount of profits will not be a pro amount of profits will be a problem. Same way if you see here. If the agent secures orders for other non-residents under the same control of the principal non-resident. So if let's say he is getting sourcing the orders for five companies, but everything is control. Exactly. That's all. Sole agent, you are not trusting. Sole agent, we don't trust. And that, that is something called there is a concept called even in tax treaties it is there, shortly called uh, D A P T, which is called dependent agent permanent establishment. Dependent agent, permanent establishment. So, if you have an agent, he is only working for you, he is called a dependent agent. He creates a PE for you. Proportionally, not the entire profit should be taxed. Proportionately, whatever is the activity he is saying, he will be doing. If the tax department sees that, okay, you are compensating him for the activities at arm's length basis. Like, if somebody, a third part does it, arm's length basis, no problem. Else, you have a problem. This is the concept of agency where even you don't have any physical presence, but through an agent you become taxed in India. How do you find it? Yes, I can know it. See, again, that is during the assessment only. The risk is like you are doing no, we, are, we are concerned at the time of remittance. But then how do I find it? So here there won't be any problem. See, this is not at your risk. See, this is not the risk of the payer. See, the risk of the payer will get stopped by taking no more PE, TRC, tenants, that's all. Now, you may not invest in any of Same like how you want to do a salary. When we deduct salary, we take proofs. See, I have to ensure whatever proofs I get is correct. I do not investigate whether the proof is right or That onus is not on the assessing. Same thing like this. You have to get these declarations. You may not check whether the declaration is right. Anyway, it gets covered as a no PE. No PE. By a declaration. Simple. So, yeah. so, first one is like, who, how do they will, uh, who will be assessed? Uh, so, the, 
agent becomes SSC in default. So it will be through the agent, only the foreign person will be there. So agent here will be the SSC in default or the SSC who is responsible for making the payment of taxes. So the agent is so, an SSC of India, no? he is that. Okay. But what is the question of taxing somebody overseas? Somebody overseas is because this person is acting for the non-resident. So whatever profits I want to tax the non-resident, I tax it through this agent. So supposing he has received another uh, money that is under agency commission from the foreign company, department will through the agent, they try to track the amount, exact amount. Exact amount, and whether I need to, you should have got more money is what the question comes. Again, that will be taxed again to the agent. It because he is the only person other than Correct. So that foreign company doesn't have any issues. Typically, he is dealing with a foreign company, you know, 163, you know, a negative assistance. What do you think is very unfair? There is nothing called fairness in tax. <laughs> well, the fairness of a business, yeah, what? Yeah. For an agent, you are taxing. And then you are just having an agent for somebody, he is going to be taxed. But what is that? Sir, take an example. Yeah. 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 Three years back it happened. Huh? Three years back it happened. Ah. So this is a stop. Then this person who is an Indian agent is going to be, the key is there. Yes. 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 So I have one more question. How this attribution happens? So, see, attribution is a formula. There is a, there is a formula for attribution uh, which is prescribed for the capital asset. So, like, let's say, <coughs> see, here, now, if you see in this question, if you see here, there is a foreign company, one, foreign company two, that means there is an Indian company having assets in India. Now if the foreign company two transfers the Indian company shares to another company, then this value will be taxed in India. Now you take one example where this foreign company has one more subsidiary which is in another country. Then there is a formula to say so much of consideration which is attributable to the value of assets in India, then it gets taxed. So the value, the total value of the company is 100 crores, of which the Indian company fetches 50 crores, then 50 percent is what the consideration on which tax is liable. Same way, if you see, uh, if you see a so the, the attribution principles goes in line with the transfer pricing. So the transfer pricing provisions to say, okay. You manufacture in India, I will look at your entire PNL. Now, your entire PNL, you make a margin of let's say 10 percent. So, the foreign company's PNL they will take. On the foreign company's PNL, what is your margin? I make 10 percent margin. Okay, right. Now, in India, you have carried out an activity. What is the cost of the Indian activity in your overall total cost? You get a percentage. So, this is the percentage on which you should have made a profit. So, that is how the attribution will work. So, let us say I have, so to, to put a very simple example, they will do benchmarking of uh, comparison. So, there is high level benchmarking. To say any company, any Indian company, they are making 10 percent. No, see, comparables is, see, here the attribution is not on the comparables. Here the attribution is on the activity. So, for example, let us say I have 10 employees in my company. 9 is in the US, 1 person is working in India. Okay, so now you are making 10 percent profit. Okay, 10 employees, 10 percent. Okay, you pay 1 percent in India. Very simple term. So, uh, again, so this, uh, you can just extrapolate to say, okay, number of activities, you do research, manufacturing, etc., and then you do trading, ma marketing here. Okay. Come to your example of story madam. Story madam. So now, typically, what happens? I do entire manufacturing etc. I only do storing activity. Okay. In my overall cost, what is the cost of storing the goods in India and then transporting it and delivering it to the customer? Okay. This is the activity only I do in India. Now let's say the overall cost, this contributes 10%. So they say okay, in your overall profit, you pay me 10% of the overall profit as taxable in India on which you pay tax. So that's one way of identifying it. See, here, uh, 
when you see that in transfer pricing, some of uh, it, it becomes more complex. If you see this indirect transfer, there are a lot of complications in terms of the concept will be fairly easy. Okay, now I understand the, the in India, if you have an asset, you get taxed. But now, how to quantify it will be a very difficult thing. That is what now a lot of governments are coming together. If you see, uh, there is something called uh, base, B, B, as they say, base erosion profit shifting. Yes. Something they say. And then there is something called a country by country reporting. Now, there is a transfer pricing, CBCR. Country by transfer pricing is fairly simple. And slowly it gets complex when you are going to master file, where you have to give the details about the entire group. It becomes more complex when you are going to for CBCR, country by country reporting. Now, country by country reporting is where I actually tell entire details about my supply chain, okay, where I have my R&D, where I have my um, IP registered, which is my finance function, where I actually have my customers. So, if you simply go by the headcount, my R&D headcount will be hardly 10 people. Okay, if you see any pharma company or any engineering company, my R&D will be only 10 people. But 40% of my expenses will only go for the R&D. And my manufacturing facility may have 100 people. But the cost of the 100 will be lesser than my R&D people. So, that is, you know, then they will see, okay, how much to allocate in every jurisdiction. So, that becomes more complex. Give so, you an example, sir. Hmm? Not see, okay, see in this attribution, for example, let's say the company will take the example of Apple. Okay, we'll take an example of an Apple. So what Apple does is Apple never pays taxes, they say. So Apple has their corporate office in Ireland. So this is the corporate office. They, they have set it up here because of tax reasons. So Ireland and their manufacturing is in China. Their R&D is in the US. And they have their distribution in India. Distribution. Distribution is here. Manufacturing is in China. R&D is in USA. And their finance is in the uh, Ireland. Now, let's say Apple makes rupees 100 profit. Now, the total cost of, let's say, their, their cost is 50 rupees. Now, their cost is split. In R&D, they spend 35 rupees. In manufacturing, they spend 10 rupees. In corporate, they spend 2.5 rupees. And in distribution, they spend 2.5 rupees. So, if you see the cost mix, my major cost sits in the US, my manufacturing cost of 10 sits in China, corporate cost 2.5 and then distribution cost 2.5. So, now out of my profitability, they apply the same proportion to say you have to tax based on this proportion in India, 2.5% or let's say 5% or 50, okay, you pay 25, 2.5 rupees tax here. 2.5 here, 35 here. That is how your profit gets split across. Earlier, they were never paying tax in Ireland because the entire profit was sold in Ireland. I will only say cost plus percentage. Let's say 5% in USA I make, manufacturing I make 2%, distribution I make 2%. So, most of my profits were settled in Ireland where there was no tax. So, that is where they were trying to bring in the CDCR to identify the entire supply chain where you create value and where you want to pay tax. So, the latest in this, latest trigger is this something called Pillar 2. Pillar 2. This is again a very big concept which is coming under OECD where a company's uh, turnover, Euro 750 million. If, if the group, the group's revenue is more than 750 million, the, the pillar 2 conditions will apply, which means that 
in every jurisdiction you should have a minimum tax of 15%. India has yet to sign it, many, many European countries have signed it, UK has signed it. So, this pillar 2, once it applies, the taxing right gets split across all countries where the company operates. So, if you see why equalization levy was removed, is because of lobbying by the US to say, you should implement pillar 2 in the process of equalization levy. That is the reason why equalization levy was removed. Because many US companies have been tax in India, including the uh, Amazons and the Googles. So they just took go equalization to 2%. So it is because of this uh, lobbying. So just coming back to one more concept in this uh, SEP agent. This property are sourced in India. So, whether you, your properties in India, two concepts, one covers both movable and immovable property. So, one is the business connection, second is based on agency you are getting tax, third is you have a property in India. Now, property in India, whether movable or immovable, still, if anything happens to property in India, you derive income, it is taxed. It is covering all class of income. Like it can be income from house property, it can be income from capital gains, or it can be income from business or production. Which category, if you, you want to cover, that is not discussed. Anything is taxed. Income from hiring of furniture in India arising from property. If somebody hires, a, let's say a US company wants to build a big property, let's say a big dam in India, they are hiring a crane which is situated in India, but it is owned by a Chinese company. They are paying the money there. Still, it is the property hired in India, it is taxed. So, anything in India, even movies, this is possible and the films of motion pictures will be property. So, let's say somebody hires a movie and screens in India and gets money from some other country, still, movie, property, in India, still, it is getting taxed. So, they say any income which has a source of property located in India are connected to India, you have to pay tax. As I said, so the same concept for assets and more importantly, even intangible assets are covered. So let's say you have a trademark uh, in, in, the, in the concept of, let's say, a, a brand or a trademark. So very simple example happened was, uh, you would have heard of the case of Samsung Samsung. So there is something called an ex expenditure term, advertising and marketing expenses. Okay. So this came in the concept. So this was the term AMP. They say advertising, marketing, promotion. So this was also a very interesting argument taken by uh, taken in the context of transfer pricing. It's a simple term called AMP, advertising, marketing, and promotion. So, what they said is, Samsung had a subsidiary in India, Samsung had a parent. So, Samsung in India was giving so many advertisements, you would have seen the advertisements given by Samsung, uh, Sony, in the huge advertisements, entire full newspapers, front page, back page, during the Diwali's, New Year's. So, the, the tax authority said, see, you are promoting the brand of Samsung. And Samsung is a Japanese or a Korean or LG, Korean. LG, Jap, LG, Samsung, etc. So you are promoting the brand of the company in India. You are incurring advertisement expense, marketing expense, promotion expense. They say because you are promoting the brand of a foreign company, you should have charged the <coughs> revenue from the foreign So this is an intangible. Here you are promoting the intangible, you should not charge it. So you should pay tax on it. And then they say, no, there was a little, lot of mitigation stating, no, we did not promote the brand, we are reselling the products in India. Then they say, no, selling the products versus promoting the brand, you have to distinguish. Then they arrive at a percentage, and now they say, even if you are promoting a brand of a foreign company, though he may be your holding company, you should charge for it. I need because you are doing an activity in India which goes untaxed, so you should tax it. So, 
even in sort of an intangible asset is also law. So how would you say? How would you say that if you if again if an Indian company is incurring a lot of expenditure, promoting brand, then you have to say I either I am doing it for my product or if it is brand, then I have to charge for the product. So see, it's again a learning for the tax department. They try to keep adding and adding and year on year. If you see the explanation which has come here, it is multiple experience. Like how, for example, a, a, as, a, as an auditor, when we put the notes to accounts, okay, when we put the notes to accounts, we keep adding notes to accounts. Year on year, you get some learning, you added notes to accounts. Year on year, if you see the tax audit report, <coughs> you give more scope limitations. Like, okay, I can do this. If you see, is it really possible for you to even say uh, class 44? Now, see, how do I even say? Now, for example, uh, one, one company asked me, just reconcile me class 44, class 34, and then form 26 years. So, these three questions. So, the 26 years has 156,000 line items. So I said, see, I have a tool which will reconcile you. For doing these three classes, you have to pay us 10 lakhs. Now, why do you want to pay 10 lakhs? I'm only paying 15 lakhs to make tax on it. So see, these are the three classes. I do one thing. You ask your tax audit to do three, three classes. I will do the tax audit for you for seven lakhs. Because the risk is only in these three classes. Other classes is okay. See, now if you see the class, if you look at the classes, they say you have to comment that there is no, in, in tax we call it as the GAR, impermissible avoidance agreement. The company has not entered into any impermissible avoidance agreement. So as a tax auditor, you have to say yes or no. How do you do it? Okay, now you have only kept. So, year on year, I, I identify places. I have to de risk myself. Now, the question will come, now by caveating, are you being negligent? See, if you look at Nafra, now see, I, I fall part of one company where our audits are also taken. Now, some of the questions will be fine, but some will be like, you should have seen everything. Everything is same. Now, in terms of the awareness agreement, we don't know whether they have taken or not. Class 44, they would have 20 GST heads. Now, Imagine the time you can put your people on it, you can sign it, and will you be compensated? No. Now, having 20 GST and center of 5,000 crores, the time you can't do, and then class 34, you can sign it. So, now, something has to be reasonable. And somehow, that's why we have to put in more and more learnings and more and more classes to at least safeguard, like, and protect ourselves from negligence. We say we have done due diligence. Probably beyond that, it's not possible. Income means net income or uh, gross income? Here, income is the gross amount, and then what is the tax payable will be factoring your expenses. But very good. Net, yes, yes, yes. So, this is what we said the transfer of a capital asset situated in India by non resident is taxable in India. Capital asset is same, section 2. 40 and transfer definition is 240. 47. This is the important thing. Centers of shares, place where the company is incorporated. So when an Indian company shares are transferred, it is fairly simple. There is no problem. Then this is this was an unique case, centers of an intangible property. So this came in the case of uh, an Australian company called Fosters. You see where this is Fosters. Fosters, what they said is, as part of some agreement, they CUB PTY Limited, which was earlier called Fosters, it's again an Australian company. So they had a brand. So the Indian company was was a subsidiary of an Australian company. They had a brand called Fosters. So they were manufacturing and selling under the brand. Now, when the Australian company wanted to sell the shares of the Indian company. They sold the shares of the Indian company for X price and the brand also they sold for Y price. So the Indian company shares sale to pay capital needs in India. So, but the brand, whatever they sold, 
the intangible right they sold, they say it is not taxable in India. Because I registered the brand in Australia, so I don't, I, why should I pay tax in India? The Indian tax authority went ahead and said, no, the brand was used in India. Because the brand was used in India, it is taxable in India. As a capital asset. It went to the courts and finally the courts said, see, this is the term, we, uh, some <coughs> term, which is a Latin term, which say, the situs of the intangible property goes with the situs of the company which owns the property. So, it is the intangible asset is was in Australia only. So, that amount will not be taxed in India. So, this was the case which said, intangible asset will only go with the where the it is registered. So, it is not registered in India. So, it will be Australia. Then the indirect transfer rules. So this is what we discussed in the Vodafone case. Indirect transfer rules were introduced in 2012, but retrospectively. So that was the problem. This overseas dividend, as I said, it is not taxable. This was the attribution of income rule, rule 11 UC, in proportion to the value derived from India, where the shares value. So take one, uh, just taking one example. So if you see, uh, this is the where the value of the Indian company shares are derived in India, it becomes taxable in India. That is the definite, that's the amendment they brought in. There were some exceptions. Like if you are an FIA, foreign institutional investors, then you don't have to pay tax in India. Now, what is substantial value? That is the very critical. This basically does it mean they want to you know increase their sales actually. Increase?
nobody is ready to put in money there purely because they don't trust you. You will say yes when you want money and then they can conveniently go back. So to give you more sort of uh, perspective, it was a different perspective when, we, when I was discussing with a couple of big investors. They say that we are happy to invest money through Singapore and not through Mauritius. And the reasons they gave was very interesting. They say Singapore as a government has the capability to push back Indian government for any specific information exchange or any specific amendments they want to do in the tax law or the regulatory law. They have the ability, but not the sort of Mauritius government. So we see we Singapore is more productive than the Indian, than the Mauritius. So it's more like how investment has to be around us. So the government is trying to bring in more investment so that the, the market as well as ability to invest more in the sectors are improving. So that's the reason and here again FIA the only objective is there is no operation, it's more investment. So I don't see a value, value appreciation for Indian assets. I don't, the FIAs are not concerned. I invest today, probably I will take it next year. But what they want to tax here is I invest today after 10 years I am trying to value or encash my appreciation. So that's the logic behind exempting FIAs. Substantial value, they say, minimum of 10 crores. So, if you look at it, the section, the, the, the underlying asset condition section will apply where you have a minimum of 10 crores of asset of the entire uh, company located in India. And the second point is, the company should, uh, Indian asset should contribute at least 50% of the total overall assets. So, just to uh, go back to this condition, so this, this case where if you see after this section was brought into place, the condition is the value of the asset in India here in this case should be minimum 10 crores, 10 crores or more, first condition. Second, the value of this company here should be at least there is the total value in this company, 50% should be gone should be contributed by Indian assets. So if this is company is valued for $500, then the value of the asset in India should be at least $250. Only then they will say this transfer is taxed in India. So they came up with a relatively an acceptable proposition. So smaller, smaller things get Smaller things get accepted. So but what is the valuation? Uh, same like any simple valuation, whatever you do for level you gave, they say uh, asset means fair market value, uh, uh, debt as, credit as, cash. Valuation is very simple, they don't go to DC, it's more the level you gave. Breakup value is fine. Yes, it's fine. Breakup value is fine, but it gets more complex. You see, I'll just show you another example. India, Mauritius. India will again have another subsidiary, other than So. That has to go under the image. So there are some uh, around complications. So then you can easily go like this like valuation. Then cross because I can value the foreign companies at this year. Consider the value. See, correct. No, no, exactly. See, that is possible. See, it is see. You know, they really want to see what is the value you get. See, if if somebody is valuing, you have to agree with the valuation. Right. See, this two independent parties. You see the transfer. Ajis and SR and Vodafone were two different parties. Now, you will have the valuation report. Valuation report will clearly talk about Indian company's valuation. See, oh, I can yeah. register my IP in game and I And I can say my brand and IP is yeah, yeah. very close. Exactly. Ten close is in that is, see, if you are able to plan it and that plan is able to be sold to a tax office or tax office may delay but at least if the plan will be able to sell at the court level it is fine. See, when, when some valuation came before I think Rajasthan High Court or Gujarat High Court, they say like see, you see a valuation was given on year 1 and you are testing it in year 4. Now see the assumptions. Now let's say I have assumed a growth rate of 15% in your valuation certificate. 
the company was able to achieve a valuation of uh, around the 12 percent. The value is fairly small, so you are able to because it can be accurate. But you are estimating a turnover of thousand crores for one, two, three. Whereas the turnover achieved was 750 crores, it is fine. Okay, like that. But if the turnover is only 10 crores, there is a gross error in your values or your value assumptions. So that you have to be able to prove. So it cannot be grossly negligent. So that is something which you can plan in place. That is possible. So they came up with these rules. 50% specified date, there was a specified date mentioned on what date this value has to be done. So, and then small shareholder up to 5%. If you are, so you will meet this condition of 10 crores, you will meet this 50% of the assets, but when you are transferring, you are holding only 5%. So, if you see this condition, here we did not mention anything. Let's say CGP transfer only 5%. So they were holding only 5%. They transferred the 5% here. Then they say, okay, let's not discuss because 5% is small. So if CGP is holding only 5% ultimately in HCL, then this entire provision will not happen. So no problem. So if you are holding more than 5% of the shares and the shares, the whole company value is 10 crores in India and more than 50%, is held in that company, then only this section of play. So where if your holding is only 5%, you are, this entire provision will not be applicable to you, you will be out of this provision. So this is the example. So foreign company 1, foreign company 2, this foreign company 2's shares are transferred by foreign company 1 to another foreign company. Determination of a specified date to be determined on the basis of book value of assets of foreign company 2 of which the shares are being transferred. So I determine the foreign company 2's value. Step 2, determination of fair market value. The fair market value determine FMB of India located assets and FMB of all assets of foreign company 2 on a specific date. So I will value this company and this company. Then Determine if the FME of assets located in India is more than 10 crores. So, the value of the asset first condition is it has to be more than 10 crores and represents more than or equal to 50 percent of the FME of all assets of F2. This so, second point. Pro proportional rate is if step 2 is satisfied, amount reasonably added assets located in India to be determined as per the prescribed method, which is the method. How much has to be attributed in India? This is how the indirect transfer computation works. So, then that computation you will have to apply on the percentage of shares. So, this is for the total value. Now, what is the price or percentage of shares I told? I will apply this. Now, what is the specified date is the question. So, they have given two options to make the life easier. Specified date means last date of the accounting period of the company or entity immediately preceding the transfer. So, F2 company shares are transferred, the last accounting period or the date of transfer, or the date of transfer, if the book value of assets of the company or entity or the date of transfer exceeds the book value of the last immediately preceding accounting period of 15 percent. Because, okay, I go by this date, but if there is an increase in value of the company by more than 15 percent, then I have to only take the date of transfer. So, simple example, date of transfer is 24th March 2024. Book value of assets of the foreign company is on 31st March 23, which is the immediately preceding accounting year, is my address. Book value of assets on 24th March is 525. Whether exceeds by 15%, the answer is no. It only exceeds by around 5%. So, answer is no. So, specified date will be 31st March 23. So, I will go by the value of 31st March 23. Case 2, 500. This becomes 600. So, you increase by 20%. So, I need to do the valuation of 24th March 23. 500, 450. It is reduced by 10% still you will go by 30 plus part. So if there is a change in the value by more than 15%, then you 
go by the changed value or else you can go by the old value. So it is up to you to decide. Only it seems it's yes. so only it seems. Reduction still hard. Yes. So what is the significance of benefit of finding different specific things for the tax planning? There is see effectively there is no tax planning. See you you see it is again the possibility of a valuation. Okay, see now I have to create you look at it from the global context. Global context. FCO has we have ten subsidiaries. Now I have to draft a balance sheet on 24th March 23. Now imagine you need an SAP, you need 15 people to do it. Awesome. And somebody has to I will not trust the balance with people. I will have to audit it. So that is the problem. Now still see the unfortunate side of it, I will the unfortunate story here. To test whether it is more than 15%, you need the balance sheet on the papers. But whether you want to, and tax authorities can still ask you to give to those two balances. But you will be saved by up to an appreciation of 15%. You will be saved. You will not pay tax on the so for saving that 15 percent, you have to create a balance sheet. Again, that was saying is whether you are saved or not, still you have to present the balance sheet. So there is lot of complexity around this. The only saving grace is go by the revenue rate, simple valuation methodology. You need not take the big assumptions, etc. So that's the so only. You say assets includes current assets. Everything. There is no need to minus the liabilities or not. That is for the valuation. Valuation you can minus, but to determine, see, you need not, you cannot take, you cannot reduce liabilities to reach this debt curve. Debt curve is only assets. The threshold to determine whether the section applies this debt curve is only asset. But to decide on the taxable value, I will give you those liabilities. So, see, what is taxable is the net consideration and the profit you make on that. For that, we will factor in liabilities. But to test whether section no, applies. Is there book value? See, the accounting book value means this is a cost. No, there is no depreciation at value. It's correct. This only 15% is test to see which is the value I have not applied. For taxation purpose, we have a, see, to compute the taxable value. We will only go by the FMB of land, building, etc. But this is just to see whether which date I will have to consider. Which balance sheet date I will have to consider. No, I am confused because hmm. book value, there is a net book value. Correct. See, when you say book value, because I feel the cost of the, the, the machinery or whatever, that is book value. But when you say net book value, it is after depreciation, there is a net book value. That is, that is what is relevant. Then, see, book value, whatever we mean here is the value of the asset less depreciation. That is what depreciated value. Depreciated value, yes. But here, we only go by the book value of the assets. But when I have to compute the taxable value, I have to take the fair value wherever it is applicable. So it is only to test what date I will have to factor the. So the auditor has to do all these experiments. Company has to give all these excess. No, but then how, how can you, as an auditor of local company, will ask for the foreign foreign countries balance sheet and all? Who will give you? See here, this is the this is the uh, obligation of the foreign company to pay tax. So it is this person who have to prepare everything. And see again when when we are when this kind of sale happens, there will be a diligence which will be made. And then the buyer, acquirer, again he is also liable under uh, the SSE default, say Vodafone case. So he will mandate you to submit all these data and then in most cases they will apply to the tax office, take a withholding tax order, what is the tax percentage they have to deduct and remit before you pay the consideration. So in most cases if you see, we will, they will do this working, they will present to the tax office in India, take an LDS, 197 or 195. 
The stock exchange was so worried. I said, how come the people have got too much money to put in a small showroom? Five crores he expected. He got 250 crores. And this is called angel dust. No? But the, the difference between what you are subscribing and what you are expecting, and that I think we were lacking before. Yes. But now, what I'm saying is, the Indian is, India is economic wise, it is very uprising. People have got money to invest. But in that case, why do you just make the law so simple? It's a I have been coming here for the past 3-4 months, I have been telling the same thing to all people. Right, see, it is going to see, our institute has to do something. We cannot be just sitting there, just go, go, go there, thank you very much, thank you very much, thank you very much, go away. See, again, there are few, few things less spoken as well is good, but again, institute has a lot of other problems in that. There are some other problems in order to stay in address, in tax will be the last problem on which Unfortunately, they are, see, it, it, it's somewhere like this. It's not the institute, really. the business community has to say. Because see, every time the government looks at the institute as you are only sort of talking for the business. Business is free, they are okay. Why do you want to come and keep talking about let CIA come, let FCCA come, let NASCOM come? See, I am only facilitating the business. I am when only when it comes to my profession, if you are hitting my profession, then probably I may come. Here I am only trying to facilitate the government in collecting the revenue. See, barring the consultants or barring the auditors, nobody will tell the, uh, the business to say this is your accounting standard, you have to follow accounting standard, you have to disclose this, nobody tells you. By putting in those efforts and telling it whether you are compensated. So, so this is so this is another interesting part salary. So we come to salary here. Okay, can yeah. go back to that straight. Uh, just to summarize, uh, so this here uh, the uh, foreign company, the shares of foreign company who is getting transferred, uh, or the acquirer is transferred. No, acquirer. It is yeah. acquirer is transferring for the transfer. Yeah, the acquirer is buying the shares of the foreign company too. So the uh, foreign company one. Okay, so foreign company one is a shareholder of foreign company two. So uh, the shares of foreign company two becomes a capital asset over here. Okay. And the consideration, whatever is being paid, will be the same consideration. Correct. Okay. Yes. And uh, the cost of acquisition for them would be same cost. Whatever they are, uh, see, cost of acquisition is the cost which I invested in it. See, it's a proportional. See, or or the. Acquisition cost of the, the foreign company one, the investment that has been made into foreign company two. Right? Okay, and what is the relevance of the uh, uh, book value over here? See, the book value here, it's like this. Book value goes in only one place. So, you see here. Now, what is the date? So, you see here, there are two dates. I need to determine the fair market value of both the assets in India and the assets in overseas. Now, to determine the fair market value, I need a date of accounts. Now, date, the law gives two dates. I can either choose, so the date of transfer is 24th March 24th. So, I can either take the balance sheets on 24th March 24th or the last accounting period of F2, which is 31st March 23rd. Now, if you see, the book value, so I don't go to fair market. If the book value of assets as on 31st March 23 is not less than 15%, so to put the other way, around, if the book value of assets of the company or entity on the date of transfer exceeds book value on the last date of the immediately preceding accounting every 15%. So, which means you have invested from 31st March. 23 to 24 March 24, more assets, more than 15%, then there will be a change in the value of the company. So, I will have to take only this rate. So, this is just to determine on what date you take the list of assets. And then, consideration is fixed. Definitely. Yeah. So, the consideration will be compared with the fair market value for the uh, to determine the no, Yeah, correct. To determine, so I fix the consideration. Consideration is fixed. So, they have not touched the consideration. Now what I will test is 
F code to assets and F Indian companies assets. I will see the proportion. Let's say India contributes 25 percent, only 25 percent. Then on the consideration, let's say 25 percent of the consideration becomes taxable in India. Again, you have your cost. I will reduce the 28 percent of the cost and balance you by taxing. So you will be given due regard on the cost and there is no problem, they will see. Uh, we have a rule, right? rule 50 C, 50 CA, the fair market where you can increase the consideration of a private company. So those increase will not happen here because it's all outside of the country, so there is no problem. They will not distribute the consideration. You have the fair right to make a loss also here, so no problem. But they will decide what is the consideration charge of the product. That's their whole story. And then 20 percent, you said 50 percent. No, sir. I am saying assuming that is more than 10 crores. Yeah. The value is more than 10 crores. See, 50 percent. Uh, yeah, correct. I'm sorry. 50 percent is within this. Yeah, 50 more than 50 percent. Okay. Let's assume something that 10. Whatever the value you are telling for yes, the foreign company. So now you assess the value of this asset, and when coming to foreign company, you eliminate the holding the Indian company and for the balance you see this. So for the foreign company too, what is no, what is taxable in India? How do you arrive at the value of the foreign company? Huh, because that has got yes, shares yes, of Indian company. Yes, so I'm eliminating the shares of Indian company and then arrive at the value. Right, yes. So overall, see this is again total and value. And take the valuation report. report. Yeah. So it's again complex or not okay. straight for not uh, simple. Yeah. Suppose you put Yes. Supposing F2 is uh, about only Indian companies. That means you spent yes. 100 percent. That is the 10 percent. Uh, See, you have spent 100 percent. No, 100 percent is there, but 10 crore it has to be. So if you oh, process 10 crore, so it will be taxed. See here, so simple. If I if the F2 sells the shares of the Indian company, it is straight for it is yeah. Indian. Asset. But if FCO1 sell the shares of the FCO2, then first the condition is it should be more than 10 crores. Value of asset should be more than 10 crores. Only when you cross that more than 10 crore, the indirect transfer will trigger. Here it is anyway 100 percent, so 50 percent is anyway crossed. So you will be taxed. So, so 10 crore is the number which you have to cross. That's the first condition. There is no DTWA, Indian DTWA doesn't trigger at all here. Because of the Indian income tax law, I am taxing. Taxing who? Taxing the FCO1. So now FCO1 is having the constitutional rights to take the DTWA. Yes, FCO1 can apply the India Mauritius as a DTWA. And, but if the transaction, there was a grandfathering given for. Uh, India Mauritius 20, 2015, sorry, 2017. So there was an exemption where if the shares are held in Mauritius of Indian company, and if, if the Mauritius company transfer the shares of the Indian company, it is not taxable in India because of the India Mauritius Treaty, and capital gains was exempt in Mauritius, so no tax at all. Then they slowly Dilute it. So any investment made after 2017, but before 2018 is 50 percent. 2018 to 2019 is 25 percent. For 2019, it is all taxed. They can cover Mauritius. Singapore was mirroring Mauritius. So once Mauritius got amended, Singapore also got amended automatically. So if these investments were made prior to that period, then you can still take that exemption. I will not be subject to tax in India. But now, in today's case, everything is stopped. 
anyway, whatever will be done will be taxed. And unfortunately, capital gains, uh, there is no different preferential rate in the treaty. You have only go by the domestic tax or income. Only royalty or FTS has the preferential rate, 10% or uh, some rate. No, there is no difference in rates. It is uh, the same rate. So they are the tax resident of the other entity. Okay. So the, whatever taxes they pay in India, they can take credit of that in the other country. So their primary return will have to be in the country of residence. Primary return will be in the country, the country of residence. Ah. Okay. And in India, they will file the return in the capacity of a non-resident. They pay tax in India. So they have to pay tax in India and claim credit of the taxes paid in India in that country. So because, see, that country will be an overall tax. So in the foreign jurisdiction, you will have to pay an overall tax. The, so let's say the, the, the jurisdiction of FCO 1 in the example, my entire tax below will be taxable there. Now, to India, I only pay a portion in the proposed state value. So this will also get folded into the other country's tax. As you tell them, you know, only, only shares. Only shares that India has to be paid and it has to go yeah, India has to be paid. Yes, yes. Yes. Because the value, what he says, see, that kind of, see, again, now we are only talking from India perspective. Now, if their tax rate is lower than India, let's assume a scenario where you are. Okay, sir, so let me have Let's say I have a piece of being a resident holding a foreign shares. But normally, the first the tax is paid there. Yeah, correct. Exactly. And then uh, balance you pay by pay here. Yeah. Same thing like that. See, because you are same concept. You are a resident in India. You have ESOPs of an American company. Now the first you write is with the American company because America because the share scientist is in America. But there is a physical share transfer. Correct. Here there is uh, indirect transfer. Correct. See, so, here you have a problem. Let's say you. There you make a loss. So it is the loss will also be here also because it's only proportionately you are making a loss. So you may not pay more than what you have to you are expected to pay in other country unless the taxation rate is different. Lower. Yeah. Lower. The period also differs uh, sometimes. Some countries the period is in December. Yeah. Here in March. So then the yeah, period also varies. This, this happens in many cases where yeah, you say they have very some countries also. This has a lot of in our country it is December. December. Here in March. So if you are doing a valuation according to you in mm -hmm. 31st of uh, December, and here the valuation is done in 31st of March, I think there will be a variation. See that issue has every yeah. Because So, section, uh, so 
Section 569, so 5 is the charging section for resident, non-resident, 6 is the residence, 9 is what we are talking about salary, 15 is section salary which says paid or accrued, whichever is earlier. Now salary income of a non-resident, where is this source? So here we are only considering the non-residents taxing activities. So, the place where the contract is made or the place where the payment of the employment is to be made. So this is the question where, let's say, which country I have to pay tax in case of a salary of a non-resident. So what is the connecting factor earned in India? So they gave a clarification where the salary is taxed where it is earned. Now they gave an explanation for earning. The explanation was intended to clarify. What is earned in India? What is earned is equal to the services rendered in India. If you have rendered a service in India, it is taxable in India. So let's say I am a Singapore person, I am sitting in India, working for a Mauritius company. My salary is credited in Singapore bank account. This is the scenario. So Singapore company, sorry, Singapore resident citizen of Singapore working in India but I am working for Mauritius company my salary is credited in Singapore so then they say you have to see this short stay exemption 10-6 10-6 says if you are staying in India for X number of days and your salary is paid by a company which does not have physical presence in India to and that salary is not claimed as an expense by the foreign company in relation to any income in India. If they find that, then your salary is not taxable in India. It's a short stay exemption, section 10 says. The number of days is 60 days. 60 or 90. So if you are staying in India for that number of days, 10 is 60. Your salary is paid by a company which is not an Indian company or not having a present physical P, physical presence in India and the entity does not also claim that salary is an expense for any income in India. When these three conditions are met, then though you work in India for let's say two months, it is still not taxable. Uh, shift, then shifts place of approval salary for him employment based outside India to India where the salary is served in India. If you do not fall under this exemption, in the same example, you are a citizen of Singapore, you are working in India, though you are a tax resident of Singapore also by your citizenship, you are working in India for a Mauritius company, you have to pay tax in India as salary. So there is a table, so this is a simple table which we do covering multiple scenarios. So employer based, so we are first, first column talks about employer, who is your employer. Second column services rendered, which means where I am performing my duty, just the location where I am working. Salary received, where you are receiving the salary, just credit your bank account. And last is the taxability. So first scenario, employer based in India. So, uh, employer is based in India, it is an Indian company. Services rendered in India, you are working in India. Salary received, we may either receive salary in India or if you have a bank account in any other country, it can be credited in other location also. Taxability, it is taxable in India as per section 5 <coughs> because company which makes the payment is the Indian company. So salary accrues in India. 2912 which is the salary section it says salary paid by an Indian company sorry salary for earning in India just you are working in India it is getting taxed. <coughs> so credit of Indian taxes should be available in case of in the case of a non-resident. So assuming this guy is a non-resident for the purpose of his country wherever he works then he will be able to get the credit for Indian taxes paid in Next is an I know employer is outside India, but you are working in India and 
Salary receipt, whether you get that money credited in India or in any other bank account outside the country. Taxable in India only in respect of services rendered in India. So, let's say you have out of 12 months, you have worked for 6 months in India. Then, because you have worked for 6 months in India, for that particular portion it will be taxed in India, subject to charge the exemption, which is what I meant. Assuming you have only stayed for 30 days, then you can still escape tax in India. We see many people working out of Singapore or Dubai, they come down to India, they just be there for the 60 days or 30 days and then for India because salary doesn't get taxed in India. So in that case they have to look at both the non-resident uh, 182 days and as well as this uh, short stay. Both short stay exemption. See that is what one more amendment they brought in. They say like a unique, see this was a unique amendment brought in the last budget that is March 23 uh, budget. They say, see people used to plan, multiple see people who have Businessmen they used to plan their travel or uh, stay in countries where they don't become resident in any country. So moment you don't become resident in any country, wherever you earn will get only taxed in, in that jurisdiction and you can still plan your taxes. That's where they brought an amendment in the income tax law to say if you cannot you cannot become a resident, you cannot become a resident but not ordinary resident, if your income in India is more than 15 lakhs without foreign sources. Moment your income is classy 15 lakhs, then you automatically become ROR. And then one more point they say is you are in a jurisdiction if your income is other income, if your other income is not taxable in any jurisdiction. That's what people in Dubai they started, uh, they were very panicky, and then the government immediately came up with a clarification. It says, see, this is applicable only where you are planning your taxes so that you don't pay tax in any jurisdiction. But if you are a resident of Dubai, if you are getting salary in that jurisdiction, if it is not taxing, then still that will not be taxed in India. So the, the objective was not to tax the Dubai salary in India. So they gave the clarification came the very next day of the budget. So that was so big even today. So coming back, this is subject to charge day. If you are below those 60 days, still you will not be taxed. Otherwise, it will be taxed. Third scenario, very interesting. Employer outside India, service also outside India. Salary received outside India. So, one, two, three, all the three are outside India. Then, not taxable in India. Employer outside India, services outside India, salary received in India in the same year. If the money is credited in India in the same year, Taxable will be on receipt basis. So, salary received in India, section 5, you get taxed. Both are outside India. In India, in later years, that is, your money is credited in the account but received subsequently. Not liable to tax in India in year of accrual. So, not taxable in year of receipt as salary is already subject to tax. Which means the money got accrued or credited to me in year 1, at that time it was not subject to tax in India. So then that money is transferred to my account in the subsequent year, it will not be taxed. So this is also not taxable. So in employer outside India, service rendered outside India, only taxable scenario is if you are receiving the money in India in the same year, where your employer credits the money to your India account, you will be caught. So, both cases you have to make sure either you credit the money in year one and then bring the money back in the next year, it is not, it's not a The last scenario, employer is in India. Yes. And then you bring it. No, that's exactly. Otherwise, it's for a simple the savings they are getting with that. It's all. So if it is directly crediting it, you have lost. What is working from home? You know, for a This is the scenario, sir. So working from home, so there I'm are two scenarios. Here, I'm, I'm here already from home for USA. Correct. Okay, so it should be less than 60 days. No, 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 no
this is the scenario sir. Employed outside India, service rendered in India. I am not rendering in India. I am only you know, sitting here and then rendering. Correct. It doesn't See. mean that I am rendering some services for him in India. See, you should. See, you have to look at it this way. See, the moment you, 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 the, the understanding is like this. If you say service rendered me doesn't mean you, the American company as a customer in India, you are working for the customer or you are marketing for the customer or you are delivering goods to them. You are a simple program sitting in India, you are developing program for the US company, customers in US, still you are working in India. You are serving the service so, so in India. So you can get tax in the abroad and then tax also in India. Yeah, so because, see, say you just fill the scenario, this is the US, so for them, you are working in India because I am paying salary from US, you have to pay tax in US. Yes, and then get the and then credit, here. credit here. So depends on residential status. So you, you have to pay tax in both the residents. So the taxation can be seen in that, right? Yes. yes. Credit can be taken, the benefit can be arranged. In this person you still have to go to the college. Yeah, I know. That's why they no not working. See PDS, you can still see PDS is again. It's a big discussion, but still, so long as you don't have physical presence in India, TDS is not a problem. How did that Vodafone case, the holding uh, company became the uh, SSE in default because the residential status of that company is outside India, then how it became the SSE in default? No, that is not See, happening. What that was happening. That was capital asset. Pay the capital asset and they're coming See, in a different way. 195 works in a different footing. Okay, see, 195, what happens is, though you may not be the recipient, though you may not be the payer, still, if they can track you to any of the persons as a representative as a you get caught. So that's why Vodafone got a notice. Yeah, similarly here, if the person is a non-resident, but stays in India, let's say, for three, four months. Okay, so there is no uh, exemption of that short stay. Correct. Okay. So income accrues in India. And the non-resident, uh, when, uh, when we come you up are, and as a person, you will have to pay tax. See, the yeah. employer will not be proceeded with. Yeah. You will be proceeded against. So, see, you so can, we, can we consider it this way? If at all 195 has to be triggered, then the payer should be the resident. 195? Yeah. To a non-resident. Correct. So, correct. Yeah. In most cases, 99% yes. yes. Except yes. where 91, where there are two persons, properties in India, you get. Property or shares in India, you get to Okay, so other cases, non resident is not required. Yeah. I, I have two issues, sir. Two no. issues. Two issues. One is regarding the second group. Ah. Uh, I will not talk about this uh, LED case. L? LED. 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 Yeah. So, LED is slightly different. I'll explain LED. Please. Yeah. So, uh, uh, before that, I have yeah, one more uh, uh, thing to you. I have gone through the book called uh, uh, taxation, taxation for Repatriates by Walter Brewer, written by Amit Mageshwari and uh, Sweet Mishra, Dr. Mahans. I will read out it will take two minutes. The explanation to section 912 of the Act provides that for the removal of doubts, it is hereby declared that the income of the nature referred to in this clause payable for services rendered in India shall be regarded as income earned in India. Okay, sir. It is evident from the above explanation that the Act has recognized and made a distinction by way of explanation between the terms services rendered in India and services rendered from India. For example, in case where an individual is physically present in India but is actually not rendering services in India and the services are rendered outside India from India then as per the above said to provision of the act shall the income earned by such individual cannot be deemed to approve or arise in India and hence not subject to taxation in India. Which he is copying your point that you know it should be uh, yeah, these two chartered accountants in this book they have written like this. See, it's a view. So no, I it's a view, correct. but then I have an opinion. Correct. So you see, look at it in this section. Mm -hmm. That is 10.6. 
No, the the, the my I understand. Welcome to the script seat. So services rendered in India and services rendered from India. Correct. So let's watch that. So oh, please. let's take a simple example. So this is the context where we have to see 10.6. Okay. 10.6. I have to see 10.6. Okay. Now if I see 10.6, probably you cannot project it, but at this tell you. 10.6 says the same thing. Now I work in India. Okay, I work in India. Then I work for a company who is a non-resident and who does not have any source of income or any income which is taxable in India against which my income is adjusted. Now, if the interpretation of 912 has to be interpreted in this way, now this is section 106 doesn't require this. Now, now simple. Say, let's take an example. So, I am working for BDO. Now, let's say I work for BDO Singapore. Sitting in India, I work for BDO Singapore. Then, I work for the project of BDO Singapore, which is done in, done in let's say, Mauritius. Now, can I say that my salary is not taxable in India? Yeah, that is what he says. They, they say. That's the problem. See, see, that's, see, now you read the other, see, because here we have to see the other section and see. Now, they are given a specific exemption to say, yes, I will allow you exemption. When I will allow you exemption, you, let's say you are a Singapore resident, you came to India. Okay, I have to work for me. Okay, I spent two months in India. I work for India and then I go back. Now, by reading the first line of the sentence, you have earned in India, you have earned in India, right? Because I worked out of India, but I give you an exemption. Because in Singapore company, he doesn't file return, he doesn't claim any ex expense in India. So he is not claiming any benefit of the salary you have. I have paid you, so I will give you an exemption. And the exemption is valid only for 60 days or 90 days. So that will, see that's a view which you cannot uh, apply easily because that is very litigated. So, there was an Ely Lily case. So, yes. that case was slightly different. Uh, that case was slightly different. So, what Ely Lily was? So, they, it's a different concept. So, Ely Lily, USA, Ely Lily, India. Okay? Then, Employee one, employee two. Right. What happened? These two employees were seconded from Illinois USA to Illinois India. So they came out from payroll of USA to payroll of India. Right. And the salary for EYE two were paid by Illinois USA to their USA bank account and in India, India considered these two people salary under 192 and discharged TDS and because these two people worked for India, USA cross charged the expenses and they paid back the expenses. Okay, so they say the salary TDS under 192 was discharged by India already. Immediately USA was not involved. Okay, they, they call this as this is the economic employer and this guy was the legal employer. So technically, this company already discharged TDS. So immediately India cross charged. I made the same payment. The question was whether this payment was subject to tax as FTS. No sir. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. The okay. Sir, they were saying immediately the salary. No, paid the salary. Correct. Homes, not the FTS. Correct. Paid homes. Okay. 
So Italy, Italy, Netherlands, USA, and Netherlands, see, see, they paid the whole salary of employee 122 in Netherlands yes. to their bank account in Netherlands. Yes. But since these people were working in India as a seconded employees, so they made a secondment, one year secondment to Italy, India. So Italy, India, what decide, considered their TDS. So they what was the amount? Taxable under 192, they paid the tax TDS for these two people. So this TDS is done in India. Now, because these two people worked in India, salary was paid this by this company. You now it has to be cross charged here. So they did a cross charge. Okay, now you have to pay me for the what our salary I paid them. So they did a cross charge and I have to reimburse for the cross charge. So when they reimbursed, the Indian government said this is FPS. This fee for technical service, did a tax and pay. So, even India said, I have already deducted TDS on this. This is the same payment, I am only doing a reimbursement. Now, why should I deduct tax on this? So, this was the question. So, this was a very prevalent question came for multiple companies. And the recent issue on this is uh, in, the, in GST, Northern, Northern, I am Northern, some Northern gas or something, say. They wanted GST and reverse charge for this. Sir, the Supreme Court said in this case, the LDK Netherlands case, if you, the, the operative part of the judgment, they said these four expatriates, they said no work was particularly when no work was performed by these four, uh, four expatriates. For US company. Yes, yes. And for the, uh, and for the uh, uh, When no work was performed by these four expatriates for LDE Netherlands when working for LDE India Limited in India then the say, LDE Netherlands salary should be included and tax should, should be credited. The total remuneration becomes taxable in India. My question is when work was performed, what is the position? Then it is not taxable? No, work was when, No, no work was performed. For no, no, see, in other correct, sir, see, you have, see, you have to read it as a whole. Yes. See, you have to read it as a whole. Yes. See, why Supreme Court made the remark was for this point. Huh. See, it was for the taxation of Italy, USA. See, on the context, on the context, again, huh, when India paid to USA, okay, see, for example, when India paid this money to USA, see, the, the controversy was, India paid the salary of these two people as a reimbursement to USA. Clear as I will do that. Clear on this? See, what happened is salary for those four expatriates was paid to the EUE India. No issue. Okay? Yeah. TDS was deducted yes. and paid to the Indian government. Yes. Controversy happened when the salary payment was done by EUE foreign company to their foreign accounts. Yes. Okay. Now the salary was paid by this foreign company. So they say now Indian company they worked for you in India. You pay me back the salary. Okay. So they raised an invoice stating the salary what was paid for these four people who worked for you in India has to be paid to me. Okay. You reimburse that. Okay. So when Indian company made a reimbursement for the salary to US company, okay, or the foreign company, they did not deduct tax. Okay, so, but Indian tax office said, this payment what you are doing is fee for technical service. So, you should deduct tax. That's when EU USA made an argument, when they were in India, they never worked for me. They are only working for the Indian company. So, these four people never rendered any service for USA. They only serviced for the Indian company. Which is Supreme Court also affirmed. Affirmed and said the payment by EEE India to EEE USA is not taxable. They never said the salary is not taxable. And the decision name on the salary is not taxable. And the decision crux was whether the payment, whether the reimbursement for salary by India to USA was taxable. 
what are pesticides that Indian government is paying to people sitting abroad wherever in their countries? Dividend, so any dividend paid by the Indian company is taxed. So dividend withholding tax is come. Earlier it was dividend distribution tax. Now it is a dividend tax, so which is straight away taxable in India. Can you tax in the months of recipient or not? Recipient, I will get tax, TDS, I will get tax and pay tax. So, interest, uh, it's like very simple. Income payable by the government, any interest income paid by the government, it is fully taxed. Any interest paid by the resident in India to anybody is taxed, except only one place. If you are doing any business or profession in the foreign country, and if you are able to earmark this interest is paid for that business, then that is not subject tax in India, but this is very controversial. It, will, it is advised not to take that position. Any interest you pay to non resident deduct tax and pay, except it is a foreign client. Any interest paid by the non resident for the business in India, if they are, if they are, if they are setting up any company in India and their PE in India, you pay tax, it will be taxed. So, Interest is fairly simple, no major complications. So, how about uh, factoring charges? See, there is a definition of interest. Okay, there is a very wide definition of interest. So, whether the, the documentation fees, factor, it covers everything. Anything related to a loan is interest. So, background verification, any uh, what do you call it as syndicating charges, everything is interest. So the definition of interest is very 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 clear. Your factor uh, arrangement, so whether the fee paid to the factor, will that be considered as uh, interest? See, factor is, you can take one, ex one exception where this is then outside of the country. So you are trying to earn an income from outside the country, so you can take an exemption. Factory, business income are ethical. See, it's business income for that person, so it is not taxable, you can take it. Priority FTS will be taken tomorrow. So, like both priority and FTS are scheduled tomorrow. So, this is the The last thing is gift of money, which is a recent amendment. So, 918, which is the last section in this thing. Income arising outside India paid by a person resident in India. So, which is a gift. So, if an Indian person is giving a gift to a non resident, on or after 5th July 2019 to a non-resident or to a foreign company. So if an Indian resident is giving gift to a non-resident or a foreign company, it is deemed to occur or rise in India. On or after 1st April 23, this is recent 23, to a not ordinary resident. Resident to resident gift is anyway taxed, you all know that, except you have to follow the definition of relative. Resident to a non-resident after 1st April 2023 to a not ordinary resident. So this was also include resident but not ordinary resident. Aungulami cover item which is from the last financial year is deemed to occur or rise in year. So this, the second point you have to be really, really careful. Where if you are having a person who comes down in India, occasionally you also resident but not our resident. If you are giving a gift, it is taxable in India. So how will they remit taxes? That is something. The procedures, yes, they have to take a pan. If you are giving them a gift of 5 lakh rupees, they have to take a pan. File return and claim exemption. If this non-resident is a non-relative person or is a relative person or public Sir, see, so now relative is coming under exemptions. It is see, this is any question. This is only to the extra capital, not the relative to the interest. Anything, not this, any, paid by any related, any foreign company or non resident, anyone in this term. If you are giving a gift, be it a property, be it cash, anything is covered. How do you? Track is a different question. It is tax. Whether we are able to track it or not, it is very That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it has been really a wonderful thing. We have been very patient. We have been very nice.